Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Maria Kasachengo, who's, a, who's an assistant professor of astrophysical and planetary science at the University of Colorado Boulder and the National Solar Observatory. Her research interests range from the storage of magnetic energy in solar active regions to the release of that energy in solar flares with an emphasis of comparison and integration of observations with simulations. Welcome, Maria. Hi, Gil, thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So I want to start with, uh, you have a number of different papers that came out last uh, 18 months or so. I want to start with one of them uh, to set the context for our discussion, challenges and advances in modeling of the solar atmosphere, a white paper of findings and recommendations. Uh, You say the next decade will be an exciting period for solar astrophysics. Uh, as new ground and uh, space-based instrumentation will provide unprecedented observations of the solar atmosphere and heliosphere. The synergy between modeling effort and comprehensive analysis of observations is crucial for the understanding of the physical processes behind observed phenomena. Before we get into the the details of your work um, uh, on the sun, uh, Maria, uh, could you uh, just set uh, set the context for where the sun sits in the demographics of stars in terms of size and age and those types of things? Oh, you've uh, you've chosen a very <laughs> harsh question. Oh, okay. So let's start from the first, the uh, the second one, the basic one. Yeah. Where is our sun? Our sun is actually quite boring. It's a middle-aged, I would say, white male star. It's a very regular (laughs) star. Um, Not much uh, is going on in it. Uh, It's a G-class star, uh, meaning that it's uh, uh, not a large star, not a small star. I would say it's a medium star uh, with a medium type of uh, activity. Yeah. And so... So, so, so medium age, just about four, four and a half billion, five year, five billion years old. Right. Uh, and in terms of masses, it's uh, one solar mass. That's uh, what we're thinking of. We're t- thinking of other stars in terms of like solar masses. Yeah. So you could have stars of one uh, percent of solar, or let's say ten percent of solar mass, all the way to hundreds of solar masses. So our sun is quite fairly, fairly small to little. Yeah. So, so again, sort of in the middle, 10% of solar mass, that is a pretty small star. A hundred times solar mass, that's a really big star. Um, in our uh, sort of neighborhood, uh, Betelgeuse is a, is, a, is a red giant, really big. How many solar masses does that one have? I'm not sure about this. I'm quite bad with numbers. <laughs> I think it's like so much focused 20. on the. I, I I've chosen the day star since I like to sleep in the night and don't know much about other stars. But I think you're yeah you're right. It's a fair, it's a large much larger star, much larger star. So so you are very focused on on the sun, 
and um, and, and uh, you have a specific focus on uh, kind of bridging the the observational data with modeling and how modeling could actually provide some uh, some some additional insights. You want to talk a bit about uh, how that how that came through? Sure. So now, as you mentioned in the very beginning, we're living in the golden age of solar physics. What does it mean? That means that only now we're starting to get uh, this huge amount of data from very new types of mission. We're starting to observe our sun with really high spatial and temporal resolution. While about other stars, what do we know about other stars? We get spectra for other stars, but we don't see what's really going on, on on the other stars. On the sun, we really see all these beautiful magnetic fields. We see all these beautiful eruptions. We're now even starting to understand what's going on on the sun on the very smallest scales, up to like 10 to 30 kilometers. Yeah. And so with this huge amount of new information, we are now in this unique situation of trying to, where we could actually... Uh, connect the two domains of observations, yeah, just purely observations. You just open your telescope and you observe, and then the models that we typically built in separate, separately from observations. So now, because we have all these observations, we could actually try to connect the two domains, and that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. So, so when you say observations, do we have instruments or telescopes that are continuously collecting data from the sun? That's an excellent question. We have two types of uh, observations of the sun and any other stellar object. Ground-based, this is anything you could build on the ground, on, this, on, the, on the earth where we live, and then in space. So two, yeah. types, so two locations. Advantage of the ground is that we could uh, build a huge... Uh, telescope and observe with very high uh, spatial resolution. So really see very tiny things. Uh, but then we could, uh, oh, there are clouds, there are birds, uh, uh, there are days and nights, all kind of unpleasant effects. Yeah. But then you have spa uh, space. So in space, you could send smaller telescopes because it's expensive to send stuff into space. But then you don't have days, you don't have nights, you could observe 24 hours and you don't have all kind of problems like birds or clouds. And then also you could see in whatever wavelengths you, you want to observe. Right. So do we have sort of continuous uh, data coming to us? Uh, yes. from so the that, <laughs> thank you for reminding me. Uh, so uh, in space, we have continuous observations. 10 years ago, and actually this week, we have a, we have a second meeting celebrating 10 years of Sol Solar Dynamics Observatory. So 10 years ago, we launched Solar Dynamics Observatory into space that observes the sun uh, 24 hours a day continuously. So we have all kind of continuous observations. Solar Dynamics Observatory, just one of these uh, telescopes. We have uh, a whole fleet of NASA missions uh, whose goal is to observe uh, different aspects of the sun and its effects on other planets. Yeah, and so these observations, uh, I, I would imagine it's in the, the whole spectrum, right? Both uh, infrared as well as visible and other Frequencies. Yes, absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And so, so what are the advantages of the kind of the, these various uh, wavelengths that we want to observe? Uh, is there some specific advantages to, let's say, infrared? Uh, yes. So each wavelength, uh, it actually gives you completely different information. You look at X-rays in your body and you see bones you look in infrared at your body and you see that your nose is cold when you go uh, outside, <laughs> like now in Colorado, it's minus 10. So each, each, uh, each wavelength gives you completely different information. And that's why we have so many instruments. And that's one of the advantages of sending stuff, sending telescope into space. You could see x-rays, you could see uh, ultraviolet, and these are the key wavelengths uh, to observe solar eruptions. If you actually look at, for, at the sun from Earth, many people would say, oh, it's such a boring star, nothing going on, Not, nothing is going on there. If you just even look in the, in the, using the solar filter at the sun, you see it's just a, a, a pancake in the middle of the sky, so nothing is going on. But if you, t if you, look, if you were to look at the sun 
uh, in, into X-ray glasses, you would see all these beautiful eruptions. Hmm. And then how do you bridge these observations to numerical modeling? You know, the, the, the numerical modeling that, uh, that I have done in engineering or in economics, um, we, have, we have equations <laughs> that we uh, <laughs> simulate. Uh, so, so how do you bridge this to, to numerical modeling? Uh, so yes, numerical modeling is key to understand what's going on. We cannot just stare at the sun and say, oh, next solar eruption would happen tomorrow. Although in the past, people were trying to do that, uh, looking just at the size of sunspots. Uh, the main thing that actually defines what's going on on the surface of the sun uh, are magnetic fields. So uh, magnetic fields, uh, um, what are those? Those are, you know, that on the fridge you have magnets and these magnets, yep. they stick to your fridge. So uh, similar kind of magnetism exists on, on the sun and this magnetism actually defines when would uh, uh, sunspot erupt? When would it host a large eruption? So what we do is we measure the magnetic fields on the surface of the sun. So we basically quantify the fridge magnets on the surface of the sun and we look how these magnetic fields change every every 12 minutes in the case of observatory observations. So we look at this uh, magnet's motion, how they twist, how they shear on the surface of the sun. And using these, we put them into our mathematical models, uh, specifically uh, we solve uh, some um, electromagnetic equations and then uh, uh, we use uh, some quantities that we derive as boundary conditions for our three-dimensional models of what we think is going on in the solar atmosphere. So we use, uh, we use uh, obs observation of the surface of the sun and they try to model what's going on in the, in the atmosphere of the sun. So, fields. And actually in the last six years, we created this um, amazing model called Coronal Global Evolutionary Model, a huge collaboration between uh, UC Berkeley, Stanford, uh, Lockheed Martin, and now CU Boulder University of Hawaii, where we try to build this model uh, to model this kind of um, behavior of the sun, of the solar atmosphere. Yeah, so you, so you have another paper on it. Let's talk about that. So the Coronal Global Evolutionary Model uh, you say using HMI vector magnetogram and Doppler data to determine coronal magnetic field evolution. Yes. Um, we get into the details of that. So for my own understanding, Maria, so is it uh, sort of, so you have first principles uh, from electromagnetism uh, and other physical phenomena and first principles. Uh, you can take that and then you can apply some boundary conditions uh, on that, and then you, you're you're trying to sort of replicate the observations to to sort of fine tune these models. But what is the what is the real process of the yes? Model? Why are we doing it? That's a good question. Uh, the main reason why we're doing it is um, we want to understand how solar eruptions happen, and the main reason why solar eruptions happen is because of the certain configuration of the magnetic field in the solar atmosphere. So there is this certain three-dimensional configuration of magnetic fields that leads to eruption. So ideally, we want to measure this three-dimensional magnetic field to figure out when the eruption would happen. The problem is that we cannot measure this 3D magnetic field. We cannot put a thermometer or magnetometer in the solar atmosphere. The sun is too far and it's too expensive to send anything. So the only way for us to find this 3D magnetic field is actually build a model. We have measurements on the solar surface. And then basically we have a model that allows us to extrapolate, to find this three-dimensional structure of the magnetic field. Hmm. I, I remember, uh, I don't know if I got this right, there was some plan or is it already in operation to to get something in orbits around the yeah. sun? So something a satellite yes. or something like that? Uh, Parker Solar Probe. One of the oh. most amazing missions of uh, the of, of current NASA heliospheric missions is uh, has been launched in 2018 to study the properties of plasma near the sun. So that's the case where actually 
a satellite will stick a magnetometer in the solar atmosphere. Five um, five percent of the distance to this to from from the Earth to the Sun, so it will burn in the Sun, in the solar atmosphere. But before it burns, it will tell us everything about uh, <laughs> about the solar conditions. Yes. So so this is uh, this is a mission. So you have something in orbit around the Sun, so that they can do multiple. Yes, so there is Solar Dynamics Observatory that observes the full disk um, um, yeah. magnetic fields. And actually, you could go to SDO website and see how does the sun look today? How does it look in EUV? How does it in in ultraviolet? How does it look in visual light? And what are the magnetic fields? Then you could also look, use, look at the observations from Parker Solar Probe. That's this uh, mission that has been launched into the sun to burn inside the sun. And uh, this mission tells us about the actual, like the in situ, what we call, uh, the astronomers call it in situ measurements. So the actual thermometer kind of measurements of the solar plasma. And so what scientists, what we try to do is figure out how all these observations uh, match each other. And it's actually not a very easy problem. You see a very tiny fraction of the sun using these in situ measurements. And it's a big problem trying to connect what's actually going on in the sun with these in situ measurements. So, so if you take a cross section of the sun, how would it look like? Are there zones that you have specific names for? Yes, yeah, so actually that's the um, part, that's the, um, part of solar research that uh, are quite well understood. We know that yeah. uh, the structure of the sun, it has uh, uh, um, a helium core uh, that has already burned. And then outside is a hydrogen that keeps burning and can, being converted into helium. So that's the uh, kind of the core of the sun. It's just, produ it's, um, it, it keeps burning. And then outside, uh, the energy is transported from the core to the outside layers. Uh, you have a, yeah. a radiative zone and then a convection zone where basically this, all this energy uh, gets outward. And, act and it actually takes lots of lots of years for, uh, for a single photon to get out of the solar core to the solar surface. <laughs> Yeah, so a photon created at the core will sort of bounce around for years before it actually yes, gets mm -hmm. out. For thousands of years, actually. Yeah, before it gets uh, <laughs> re-radiated and then slowly uh, mixed uh, to all the way to the, moved all the way to the solar surface. Yeah, so the so, so sun is uh, still uh, sort of a pure hydrogen to helium burning uh, machine. Right. Mm -hmm. KB metals in it, right? Yes. So, so, so it's just hydrogen to helium. You said that the core is the core is helium. So the burned fuel, so to speak, uh, is, is that the center uh, of the Yes. Sun? So you basically, in the beginning of the stellar formation, you have a bunch of hydrogen. And uh, as uh, this huge clouds of, of stuff, collapses, uh, you have a higher and higher temperature inside it. And as the temperature uh, gets to a certain uh, critical temperature, hydrogen starts uh, burning and uh, getting converted into helium. And that's actually how we get all our energy. That's why it's nice and sunny and warm outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so going back to the paper, the, the model that you described here, the coronal global evolutionary model, could you talk a bit about that? Uh, what, what is the model? So uh, the model actually uses the observations of uh, magnetic fields on the solar surface uh, to recreate yeah. what's the three-dimensional structure of magnetic fields in the solar atmosphere. And what we try to understand, we try to understand what's the real structure of the solar atmosphere uh, when uh, there is um, an explosion happening, when there is a solar eruption. Uh, there are, of course, lots of observations of solar eruptions, but this uh, model is kind of the first models that uh, uses observations on the solar surface to recreate this time-dependent model of the, of the solar structure, of the coronal structure. 
Uh, so the, is this a structural model, Maria, or does it actually have some predictability? Could you use a model to, to predict when solar flares? Could so happen? it uses the observations. Uh, so um, you cannot use it really for predictions because uh, it uses observations as boundary conditions. So you would most likely see the eruption uh, before you actually use the observations uh, to drive the model. But uh, this model is absolutely essential for understanding when f uh, flares happen because uh, since we don't have the information about the structure of the field, we cannot really uh, figure out why eruptions happen. And then secondly, these kind of models are absolutely essential as, um, as a starting point for more large scale models. What when the solar eruption happens on the surface of the sun, uh, then uh, in some conditions it propagates, this eruption propagates outwards towards earth. And what we still don't really understand is how this propagation of eruption of this, coro of this coronal mass material happen. So if we use a more realistic model near the sun uh, as a starting point for like heliospheric models in between sun and earth, then we would also have a much clearer understanding of what happens near earth when this uh, eruptive material reaches us. Yeah, so you say here that uh, electric fields drive 3D spherical magnetic friction right. model. Uh, so in these models, um, is the Earth's magnetic field and the interaction with the sun, is, is, it, is it big enough to even think no, about? No, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately not. So all of uh, this modeling that we are doing is uh, close to the sun. So all the focus is on the sun. We're really trying to understand uh, what happens with this um, close to us, but still unknown subject, our main star, the sun. And then when, so we try to understand the properties of the eruption and why the eruptions happen. And once it happens, it's a totally different story of how it affects the Earth magnetosphere. Right. And, and uh, I guess the Earth's magnetic field has, um, when, the, when the solar flares happen, uh, in some sense, we are protected uh, from a little bit by the magnetic yes, field. Yes, and actually not a little bit. <laughs> we are completely protected uh, by our magnetosphere and that's one of the main reasons why we are still me and you are still here on earth because our earth magnetosphere protects us and it's actually very interesting how the what happens at this interface between uh, earth magnetosphere and the heliosphere when the solar eruption happens you need a specific configuration uh, between the magnetic fields at, the, at this interface. So only when the magnetic fields are directed in the opposite way, uh, you get uh, aurora and all these uh, problems <laughs> with electric grids. But if you have parallel magnetic fields, meaning if the stuff that comes in has magnetic field orientation, same as um, the Earth magnetosphere, then nothing happens. It just, um, it just uh, goes around. So, uh, so yeah, we should be thankful every morning. <laughs> Say thank you to the magnetosphere. Yeah, so, so what's the real mechanism that creates this magnetism uh, in the sun? It's the movement of particles? Uh, how how uh, exactly does it happen? Excellent question. So um, we don't still understand uh, when and how the eruptions would happen. So the prediction uh, model, the predictions model, are still um, getting uh, improved uh, every day. But what we understand is that this energy comes from the energy of magnetic fields. So basically, you could imagine, uh, you could think of the solar atmosphere as a, a bunch of this um, um, storage of magnetic fields. Uh, this twisted magnetic flux tubes, what we call it, that store this magnetic energy. And when the configuration of the magnetic field changes, I know it sounds very abstract and weird, but uh, when the configuration basically changes, then you have the conversion of uh, the magnetic energy into, into heat. Yeah, so it's a bit like um, 
this is not a good analog, but the, these uh, magnets, uh, they're, they're storing energy, sort of a magnetic flux uh, mm -hmm. energy. And, uh, and, and uh, you, you know, some process then release those energy uh -huh. into heat. So they, they almost became yes. like batteries. Or, I mean, in solar <laughs> physics, we usually use this analogy of uh, twisted rubber bands. Imagine if you take scissors and cut yeah. the twisted rubber bands then, uh, then uh, you would get a snap, yeah. Yeah. Um, you, so you have another paper, uh, active region irradiance during Quisian uh, uh, periods, new insights from sun as a star right. spectra. Mm -hmm. uh, you ask how much energy do solar active regions uh, typically radiate during, uh, during this period? So, uh, solar active regions, um, is there a specific part of the uh, sun? So basically the whole sun, most of the sun is quiet, but then there are the center of activities where the magnetic field is very strong. And these are called sunspots. And the sunspots were discovered long time, hundreds of years back, because uh, you could actually see them. If you take a telescope and put a solar filter, you would see these ugly black spots. And these are the places where magnetic fields are very strong. And these are the places where typically these eruptions happen. And so in my paper, what we did is uh, we evaluated how much energy is lost by these, uh, by these activity centers called active regions. And we actually figured out that, yeah. uh, of course, you could see these uh, active regions uh, with instruments like Solar Dynamics Observatory, where you see loops and these beautiful um, features. But you even see these uh, active regions in um, spectral measurements where you just observe a sun as a star. So if you just count amount of light in different wavelengths, then you see uh, uh, that the light, amount of light fluctuates. And you could actually use the same kind of technique to observe sunspots or, or star spots on other stars. Hmm. So, so when you have these sunspots, um, is the energy output higher? Uh, uh, that depends on where you're looking at. If you're looking in the ultraviolet or X-rays, so these are the hottest uh, wavelengths. Yes, you see, you have more light. But then in some uh, wavelengths, you actually see have less less light. Like for example, in the visible sunspots are simple, simply like dark spots. Yeah. Uh, um, do we have any information? So all stars behave in this way, or do we expect, like you said, star spots? Yes. So stars? one of the reasons we did the study is because we want to understand how uh, the amount of light changes in different wavelengths. And uh, this year, uh, th this was the first kind of study to analyze uh, this kind of behavior. And one of the main reasons it has been done is because we want to extend our large amount of knowledge about our own sun and on the other stars. Hmm. Yeah, I remember um, there is certain periodicity to the sunspots, right? Um, they they come and go in in sort of predictable fashion. Right. Yes. Yeah. So you have uh, so our sun uh, has uh, this eleven years cycle uh, activity cycles. So um, sometimes the sun has many sunspots or active regions. Sometimes uh, it has none. And um, uh, now we are closely entering the next solar cycle. We are still in the minimum, but in uh, three to four to five years, I expect many sunspots and also many eruptions and beautiful auroras. Do we have a theory why? Um, why uh, there are lots of theories explaining way? why there are these cycles, but we still don't uh, understand why we have uh, 11 year cycles and not five or six year cycles. Okay. Um, and I, I guess, uh, from all the data that you have, um, everything is sort of very stable, right? All, all this data uh, appears to be, you can sort of explain <laughs> what you see. Um, mm, I mean, uh, one of the reasons, uh, Not... uh, I mean, uh, there, the solar scientists, uh, they have uh, questions, so they know uh, where they would like to look for specific things. And that's the main, that's kind of the main philosophy that drives uh, 
build, uh, building of the new missions. For example, we didn't know much about solar uh, between the uh, area between the sun and the earth. That's why we sent the Parker solar probe. Uh, we didn't know much about solar poles. That's why uh, European Union and NASA, um, ESA and NASA have last year sent uh, solar orbiter just to, to look at the solar poles. We didn't know much about uh, the um, cor coronal magnetic fields and really, really small scale features on the sun. And that's the main reason why we're now building on Hawaii the DKI solar telescope, the largest solar telescope in the world. So we know where to look for, but we still don't know many answers to many questions. Mm. Um, I know that there are a lot of uh, efforts going on to create a, a fusion device on Earth uh, to, right. to generate electricity. Um, are we expected to learn anything <laughs> that will allow us to uh, sort of translate that I into practice? I have anyway? no idea, uh, frankly, yes. Uh, that's uh, outside of my expertise. The good thing about the sun is that uh, that's a free energy. So use uh, solar energy. <laughs> you can, yes. And if the weather is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so I want to finish up with uh, one of your recent papers, uh, inferring depth dependent plasma motions from surface observations using deep well neural network. Um, so, so could you, could you describe, um, so, so what's the objective here before we talk about the, the training right. of the neural network? So this is the study that has been done uh, by my collaborator, my postdoc, uh, Benoit Tremblay. Um, so what we have been trying to do there is to figure out how we could actually use these uh, beautiful uh, machine learning methods that became so popular recently. And, in, the, uh, and uh, in solar physics now, it's a very hot topic, as you could imagine. And one of the long-standing problems of solar physics has been uh, how to determine the flows uh, on the solar surface. How does the stuff move on the solar surface? That's something that's very hard, hard to figure out from the observations. So we, uh, so one approach uh, to resolve this uh, question is to use simulations where you could train your neural network um, on the flows, on these artificial flows, and then apply to the actual sun to see what are the flows on the actual sun. Of course, you would get flows that would yeah. be very similar to what you are training your neural network on in the simulations. But um, the good thing about these flows is then you could use them uh, for a bunch of um, applications, for example, for data-driven modeling like coronal global evolutionary model that I was talking before. So this kind of uh, analysis is extremely useful for uh, as a tool for understanding uh, the solar activity. So, so just for my own understanding, Maria, so, so you are doing some sort of supervised uh, machine learning yes. technique here. So you are simulating flows and, and using those simulated results as, as labels uh, to train a, a uh, deep neural network. Not quite. Yeah, not and quite. We're actually uh, using the intensity images of the solar surface. Yeah. And basically this intensity image looks like uh, a video of, of the porridge <laughs> on the stove. You see bubbles there and the stuff flowing around. Yeah. So the question is, what are, yeah. what are the velocities? How many kilometers, what's the kilometer per second uh, measurement of each cell? And the simulations that tell you exactly that this point is moving at this speed, this point is moving at this speed. So basically you train your neural network um, uh, on this uh, intensity and speed data and then apply it to, yeah. to the actual observations to find the speeds, to find the velocity. To find the, find the speed. These are, uh, con uh, co co these are convolutional uh, neural networks? Ah, yes, uh, they, are convolu yeah, they are convolutional neural, neural, neural networks, yes. Okay, uh, and so um, 
so so um what if you're successful in trading the network what what is the output so the outputs the are actually the actual velocity fields yeah okay okay and so you could have some potential predictability then you can you can take a picture and you can use the train network to uh, to predict what the velocity yeah, exactly is, so the idea is that like you that. then you apply this neural network on the data and then you find what the actual velocity is mm -hmm. and then uh, since since in okay, simulations okay. you could easily test the performance of your methods uh, you, you test your performance yeah, yeah. first and then you apply it to the real sun yeah right yeah seems like a very interesting <laughs> interesting approach um so so in conclusion maria uh, i know that you have done a lot of work in this area um what are you sort of most excited about as you look forward i know that nasa has right. a few missions coming through right perhaps more data uh, and so 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 we look forward five years what do you think would be the most uh, most so, exciting so uh for me, in my own research, I'm most excited about the results from this DKI solar telescope that is being built in Hawaii and that will start observing uh, any time uh, within a couple of months. And this telescope will observe the sun at the highest spatial resolution ever. And you would ask, why would you want to go to even higher spatial resolution? And the reason for that is that most of the sun is actually quiet sun. So there are these regions of activity where uh, flares happen, but then most of the sun is this absolutely quiet area that in fact is not quiet at all. <laughs> so uh, with this new mission called the DKI Solar Telescope, we will for the first time observe the small scale magnetism and it will allow us to find out how much energy goes through the solar surface. How does this how does this energy get converted uh, into heat? As you might have heard, one of the largest solar um, enigmas is why the solar corona is so hot. You go further away from the sun, yeah. and then instead of getting colder, it actually gets hotter. Why is that? We still uh, don't know very well. Mm -hmm. And so the hope is that one of the things that this new telescope will uh, uh, help us answer. Uh, is this question of why this coronal heating exists on the sun and other uh, similar types of stars. Now, if you're looking uh, outside of mm. my area of research, um, <laughs> you know, in science, everybody's focused on his teeny tiny problem, even um, in the small area of astrophysics, such as solar physics. People are now are very excited about new frontiers um, of um, what's going on between the sun and earth this area called the heliosphere parker solar probe is taking real measurements of what's going on in between and um recently they have discovered that the magnetic fields there are very wiggly uh, they change their direction all the all, directions all the time even far away from the sun and why is that nobody really knows um, we also don't know what's going on in the poles. So there are lots of things happening uh, now in the sun. And that's why I would like to conclude with the same thing I started with. We're now really entering the golden age of solar physics. There are lots of questions uh, that we need to answer very soon. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, we have uh, the sun in our neighborhood uh, we're still trying to understand deeply a variety of things that you mentioned, uh, including the heliosphere. It, it's sort of analogous to um, we don't know a exactly. lot about mm -hmm. deep oceans. Or... And deep oceans <laughs> is even more important uh, than the Yes, I totally and, uh, and the heliosphere, as you mentioned, may have some implications for... Um, exoplanets, extraterrestrial life, or all of those hypotheses that, that oh, people are trying to make as well, yeah, right? Totally. So, so yeah, yeah. So understanding these, I think, is going to be crucial. Um, excellent. Yeah, uh, really enjoyed it. Thanks yeah, for Thank you very much, Gil. Me, it's my pleasure. Bye. Thank you.
This is a scientific sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info@scientificsense.com.